have ways of making you talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 18. Mocock and Lydon were waiting for the Piats to fire. The two anti-tank spigot mortars were in the room above them with Summers Woodley and the two men from Three Platoon. Behind them in the gardens were three two-inch mortars and their teams, and with them were the last of the HE mortar bombs. Bridgman slipped into the room and joined them. He had found a carpet slipper in one of the houses, and it was tied to his left foot with khaki bandaging. The mortar splinter had cut an artery without severing it, and now congealed blood and a tight bandage were sufficient to prevent any serious loss of blood. You cover the gap to the left of that house, he pointed over Lydon's shoulder. You won't get time to fire at them after they appear, so you must fire before you see them. Start slow bursts as soon as you see the pit bombs strike. Lydon nodded his fair hair and looked sideways at Mocock. The gap was only a few yards wide. He didn't think they'd make a very good killing, but he realised that they represented only one part of the fire plan. They heard Bridgman make his way up the stairs to the room above and then come out onto the landing. He was placing himself where he could get quickly to the back bedroom, the window of which looked down onto the mortar teams in the gardens. Lydon's finger curled lightly round the trigger. He was thinking about the market garden he and Mocock were going to have after the war. They had added up their gratuities, the £200 that Tom's uncle had left him in his will, the £87 that he had in the post office, and to this they had added a hypothetical sum which varied each time they discussed it, the sum they thought they might beg or borrow from members of their families. Somehow the figure of a £1,000 loomed as a necessity in their calculations, and every time they debated their future they managed to arrive at this figure, but always in a different way. Mocock blew his nose between his fingers, wiped them on a rag and pulled down on his trousers, easing them away from his crutch where they chafed and cut into him. He transferred his gaze from the houses at the top of the road to Dell's face. He didn't feel bad lying there alongside his friend, with the Germans only the distance of the short road away from them. They'd be all right. They always were. Like the time when they'd been dropped with eight others in the north of Sicily to blow telegraph posts and railway lines behind the German and Italian troops who were opposing the advance of the American 7th Army. They had been dropped over low hills. He and Dell had jumped last and had landed on the opposite side of a hill to the others. They had never managed to join up, but had wandered about the Sicilian countryside for a fortnight, living off the land, and twice they had shot up parties of German troops. They had been perfectly happy during those two weeks, and Mocock thought he would have been content to spend the whole war in similar circumstances. They heard Bridgman shouted order, and Dell closed one eye and squinted through the sights. Mocock looked up at the road and waited. They both saw the first two bombs in the air, heavy and clumsy, the tail fins rising and falling as if they propelled the bombs in flight. They struck the houses at the end of the road, and as Lydon opened fire, Mocock spotted the next two bombs on their way. After the second strike, Mocock saw the front door of the right-hand house burst open and three Germans tumble out into the garden. One had his hands above his head, the others clutched rifles, but not in the manner of men who were going to use them. They were cut down by fire from Marston's position before they had time to drop to cover behind the low garden wall. Mocock heard the mortars fire from behind the house and he saw one of the bombs fall short and burst in the road just short of the enemy-occupied houses, but the remainder threw up earth immediately behind them. If Bridgman was right in his calculations, the anti-tank bombs would penetrate the outer walls of the houses and drive the Germans out into the gardens behind where they would be caught in the open by the eight chief and the two-inch mortars. Mocock saw figures in the gap covered by Lydon, and one of them went down before the others were out of sight behind the row of houses on the left of the short road. Immediately after they disappeared, three platoons' guns opened fire, and Mocock knew that some of the enemy escaping from the backs of the houses had moved too far to the north and exposed themselves to Brown's men. It looked as if Bridgman's plan was working. Three platoons' piat and two-inch mortars had been returned to them, and both platoon fronts were quiet. A body of Poles who had got over the Rhine on the previous night were to relieve one platoon and they were to take over the school from three platoon. Brown's men were to take up positions behind the place where a handful of the 10th Power Battalion had been burned out. The reliefs were to be conducted under cover of darkness that night. After the Germans had been driven from the houses where they had attempted their build-up, Bridgman had joined Marsden in the corner house. The two men were talking quietly in the bedroom which overlooked the open ground to the south. Incessant fire from the Lonsdale force positions indicated clearly the German intention to cut the division off at its base and sever its tenuous connection with the poles below the Rhine. The bodies of Murray and McEwen now lay side by side. The sergeant had been dead by the time Brogan arrived. How did they cop it? Cassidy says he doesn't know, but he sounds a bit cagey to me. 
Marsden asked his question with a kind of brutal defiance, as if he were doing something that wasn't done, but to hell with it. Bridgman shook his head. I don't know. I wasn't here. I should think they caught a burst from down there. He nodded towards the ground to the east of the captured hospital. Marsden turned his head to look and Bridgman studied his profile. The corporal had shaved that morning. He was probably the only man in the platoon, perhaps in the company, who had. His smock, uniform and equipment were not at their best, but they looked far cleaner than anyone else's. He was half frowning, but this was habitual, and his eyes were clearer than any Bridgman had seen that day. His rather pale face was set, the jawline clearly defined. But why should McEwen be facing into the room? He had his back to the window. Christ knows, Tom, and it doesn't matter. Anything might have happened. He might have turned as he fell after being hit, or Murray may have propped him up there before being hit himself. Marsden grunted. Unless Cassidy decided to speak, he was never going to know. An unspoken conspiracy of silence was already closing round the incident, an automatic and gentlemanly decision not to discuss an unfortunate affair made by the two men who knew what had occurred. Marsden knew they were not defending the dead men, they were protecting the honour of the company, just as they would have protected a woman's honour in another century. The whole thing was absurd, but it didn't matter. Is it right the Second Army have joined up with the Poles? They have, but not in force. The old man said that an armoured group of some sort had made a dash through Oosterhout and reached Sosabowski, but that the infantry from 43rd Div were still messing around the village. It looks as if they'll get here, but whether or not they'll be able to do anything is another matter. I don't think they should try to get across here. I think we should throw everything we have to the east, towards the bridge. We wouldn't get there, but we can tame them, and 2nd Army could go for the south end. They'd probably make it. Bridgman stood up. Marsden's solutions might not be the best one, but it had its points. An obvious attempt was now being made to rescue what was left of the division, and this meant that the original objective, the catcher of the bridge, was fast being lost sight of. Marsden had overlooked the condition of the 3,000 or so men, who were all that were left of the division. It was going to be difficult enough to maintain their morale in defence. To launch them into an attack would be an impossibility. There were already many zombies, automatons, whose will had been nearly sapped by continual fighting, lack of sleep and terribly high casualties. It was a full-time job to keep them awake and in a state in which they were prepared to fight desperately to hold on to what they had. To throw them into the assault with negligible support and inadequate ammunition smacked of fantasy. The division was a good one, but it was not made up solely of Tom Marsden's. I'm off. I'll see you again before dark, unless anything happens in the meantime. The infiltration of snipers during the last three hours before darkness fell kept the whole platoon constantly on the alert, and by the time they could no longer see clearly, they did not know which houses contained Germans and which did not. Short stretches of road, which had been safe, no longer were. The enemy was directing aimed fire at divisional headquarters, and they were sniping into Blake's position from the area of the hospital they had captured between the Independent Company and 4th Brigade's headquarter platoon. Word came through that Brigadier Hackett had been hit badly in the stomach while visiting units of what was left of his command. The Germans tried to break through to the north where Jordan and the men of his headquarters watched the road east into Arnhem and the big hotel captured by the enemy which now housed airborne wounded and German soldiers. Three platoon were getting ready to take up their new position, a position which would make them the meat in a sandwich of German bread. Bridgman prepared to take out a patrol and on his last rounds before night closed in he arrived at the back door of a house just as Mocock called down the stairs for Brogan. Alan sent O'Neill for the medical orderly and went up to join the Yorkshireman. Between them, they carried Lydon's 14 stone down the stairs and into the kitchen at the back of the house. They screened the window and lit a candle. The bullet had entered Lydon's neck and travelled down into the chest cavity and the back of his smock was saturated with blood. They got his smock and battle dress blouse off and cut away his shirt and vest. Bridgman heard Mocock's sudden gasp. He looked down and his own breath caught in his throat. He stared at Lydon's back. A clean bullet wound made no more than a slit in the skin, but whatever this bullet had hit had exaggerated the exit wound so that it looked like a small shell hole. He could see one of Lydon's lungs pulsing in the cavity, and he found himself thinking of the danger of pneumonia. Quick, a shell dressing! Cock fumbled at the tail of his smock, groping for one of the big shell dressings in the back of his airborne trousers, and as he fumbled he talked to Lydon, his voice broken and despairing, when he meant it to be cheerful and reassuring. It ain't too bad. You'll be all right directly, Dell. Soon as we patched you, we'll get you to the hospital. Brogan's coming. You'll be all right, Dell. And then Mocock was crying, his mouth wide open and the tears pouring unchecked down his cheeks. His short, heavy body was shaking and the sobs were tearing their way up from his gut and out through his open mouth. 
He found one of Lydon's hands and held it in one of his own. He stroked it with his free hand and then stroked the fair hair at the back of Lydon's neck. Bridgman had to speak to him twice. Your other shell dressing. I've put that one inside. I want one to strap it to hold it in. I haven't got another one, sir. Haven't you got one? Bridgman shook his head and listened for Brogan. He never carried shell dressings. He used the two pockets at the back of his trousers for grenades, for they might kill several Germans, whereas you could only use a shell dressing once, and killing some of the enemy was more important than possibly saving one life of your own side. At least, that's what he'd always thought. I want to shit. Lydon's voice was surprisingly strong and at the same time casual. He sounded the least concerned of the three of them, but he couldn't see his back. You don't want to shit, not now, Dell. Mocock sounded like an elder brother reproving a younger one for having a call of nature at an inconvenient time. He sounded almost petulant. Bridgman said, Help me to get him up, and then get something for him to do it in. They got Lydon into a squatting position, his hands resting against the wall, and while Bridgman undid his trousers, Mocock searched aimlessly about the kitchen. At last he came towards them, a saucer, half held out in his hand. Jesus Christ, a saucer! Bridgman felt a wave of almost uncontrollable irritation sweep over him, and he had to close his eyes and breathe deeply, his lips clamped together against the explosive words building up in his throat. It doesn't matter. Hold him here. We can clean it up afterwards. A draught broke through and made the candle gutter as the three crouched together against the kitchen wall. Brogan and O'Neill arrived as Lydon strained in their arms.